to this evening's event for the North of Scotland uh, local group of uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust. So uh, the title of tonight's talk is Peatlands, what have they ever done for us? Well, as we all know, peatlands were one considered, oh, once considered to be useless. Or could someone's got their microphone unmuted? Could you please mute your microphones, everyone? Could you please mute your microphones, everyone? Thank you. Okay, so peatlands, uh, once considered to be useless, are of course now considered to be vital in tackling the connected crisis of climate change and, and biodiversity loss. Our speaker tonight is environmentalist and author Clifton Bain. He will explain why this underappreciated ecosystem is so important to our lives uh, and shares his journeys around some of our most spectacular peatland sites. So briefly, some biographical details uh, about uh, Clifton, courtesy of his publisher, Sandstone Press, which is based here in Inverness. Um, Clifton began his career in nature conservation with RSPB in 1984, having graduated from the University of Aberdeen with an honours degree in zoology. His work gave him the opportunity to study birds and their habitats across the UK and to engage in high level campaigning, uh, both on climate change and biodiversity. Over the last 10 years, he has worked with the IUCN UK Peatland Programme and on environmental policy and advocacy to promote the conservation of peatlands. A native of Edinburgh, Clifton lives with his wife and takes every opportunity to explore nature, particularly in Scotland. He's a keen hill walker and cyclist. He's a passionate believer that encouraging people to enjoy nature for themselves is one of the best ways of facilitating wider support and action for conserving wildlife. I certainly couldn't agree with him more on, on that front. And uh, it's over to you, Clifton, but just before you start, if I could just remind all participants that if they want to ask a question uh, following your discussion or indeed raise a point in discussion, if they could please do so uh, using the chat function on Zoom during the course of your presentation so that we have some questions to kick off with uh, when you've completed your presentation. That would be great. And just a final reminder, if everyone could please ensure that they remain un, uh, muted sorry, uh, during the presentation. And as I was explaining to one of the participants earlier, we usually find it helpful for those with a weak signal if everyone disables their video um, during the presentation, with the exception, of course, of Clifton. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't see his uh, presentation. So with that, it's over to you, Clifton, and thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight to give your presentation. Thank you, John, and I hope everybody can see the slide up there okay. Um, shout if not, and uh, let me know if you can hear me as well okay. Um, as John said, I work with the IUCN um, UK Peatland Programme. Uh, for those who don't know, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature is the world's largest conservation body, bringing environmental NGOs and government bodies together to tackle conservation around the world. And the UK has a national committee um, which administers things like the, the Red List of uh, Endangered Species and we are a project, the Peatland Programme, within that UK National Committee. Uh, and the important thing about it is that it brings together environmental NGOs, government, um, as well as scientists and the people down on the ground who in, are engaged in land management. So it's a big, broad partnership. Uh, and it's, its purpose, it was established about 13 years ago, is really to help bring people together to get action on peatlands and uh, address the serious threats that our peatlands face. Um, we're, I was employed by Scottish Wildlife Trust. So over the 13 years, our program has had a number of uh, partner bodies administering the project. Um, and uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust was our home for a few years. We're now based with the Wildlife Trust's headquarters uh, down in Newark. But uh, the team of nearly five, six staff now are all working from home in various places across the UK. 
uh, and we run the, the partnership, which has a, um, a, a body, a committee that looks after us as well. Um, and it's we're now up into the two, three thousand uh, partner members who, you know, combination of scientists and policy bodies and individuals interested in peatlands. So it's really grown over the last 13 years. So when thinking of peatlands, um, I think it's fair to say that we don't regard them generally as, as the British public in favourable terms. Historically, they've been derided, feared, considered dangerous, treacherous, stinking mires, um, or at best simply dull, boring, worthless land that is better turned into something else. And uh, it was really considered as only profitable if, if it was exploited for particularly fuel or for land uh, for agricultural reasons, or in most people's common knowledge as a, as a substrate for gardening, gardening compost. But we're now learning that uh, peatlands are in fact undeserving of this, uh, of this uh, bad press, if you like. Um, and what we have now is a global recognition that peatlands are actually incredibly important. Uh, this slide just shows some of the international conventions uh, major conventions like the, the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, the Biological Diversity, Biodiversity Convention, uh, the COP26 uh, Convention of uh, Parties on Climate Change that was held in Glasgow last year. All of these big institutions and, and commitments now formally recognise peatlands as being important to both the climate change and biodiversity crises that we uh, face. And we now have international strategies and plans uh, aimed at tackling the peatland problem. And here in the UK, we've led the way with the UK peatland strategy, identifying objectives and what, what can be done to tackle peatlands and helping set a course to bring people together and uh, sort our peatland problems out. And I'll explain these uh, in more detail later. So the, the, the take home message from this slide is peatlands now have a, a very significant voice and international recognition at the, the government and decision maker level. And one of the things that they've, they've identified is that this isn't just something that's nice for nature. This is central to our own survival, our well-being and our economies, this link between healthy environments and our economy is now absolutely recognized at the, the, the global level, if not perhaps by some of our past prime ministers. I uh, was involved in, sorry, run through an extra slide. I was involved in uh, working with RSPB for about 35 years. And, and when I left RSPB, I turned to writing uh, and my first book, was on the ancient pinewoods of Scotland. And the, the goal of that book was really to tell the conservation story of the ancient pinewoods, the, the, the remnants, but also to provide a guide with maps and directions on how to visit these places. It, it was quite clear to me that a lot of my friends and colleagues didn't know where the last remnants were and were interested to know um, how to get to them, and the story behind each of these sites. So that was the goal of the first book. And then three years ago now, nearly, or nearly four years ago, the rainforests, which again, a habitat very few people appreciate in the UK. This is the ancient oak woods that grow down the west coast of Britain and Ireland. And this amazing habitat is now coming to the fore of conservation effort. And again, I've given a, a conservation story and maps and details on how to visit some of the best sites. So naturally, having worked in peatlands for so long, I was told when I launched the Rainforest book, come on, you've got to do a peatland book. And my publisher at the time said, we want to be able to sell these books. <laughs> Is anybody going to buy a book on peatlands? 
And I said to him, well, to be honest, I could name you at least 40 people in sites that would blow your mind. If you visited them, you would have a fantastic day out. And the story of Peatlands is incredible. Um, and so he bought it and he accepted it. And so the Peatland book was launched uh, a year ago and it does the same thing. It gives maps and details on how to visit some of our most wonderful natural days out, as well as giving the, the amazing conservation story that I'll now uh, go into. The way I did these books, I because I was involved in climate change policy, I thought it would be a, a good exercise to get around the sites by the lowest carbon means possible. So instead of driving around them all, I use public transport, walking and cycling. And I have to say, it was difficult in some cases, especially the remote parts of the west coast of Scotland and Ireland. Um, it's not easy getting to sites, but we have a remarkable network of cycle routes, safe cycle routes, bus routes, train routes across the UK that can take you right into the heart of some of our most remote places. So it was an incredibly enjoyable experience. And because you're taking a slower journey, you have to stay overnight and you learn more about the area by not rushing through in your car. So I found it a, a very positive, rewarding experience making the low carbon decision. So what are peatlands? Um, they're basically, peatlands are wetlands. Water is the, the key element here. Um, the vegetation is specially adapted to thrive in the saturated environment and the waterlogged anaerobic conditions uh, where bacteria can't break down the plant material that dies. It limits the decay of that plant material. So the plants just persist in the water for thousands of years. And that buildup of dead plant material that doesn't rot is what makes up peat. It's the organic remains of these dead plants. And since the end of the last ice age, nearly 10,000 years ago, this dead plant material, the peat, has been accumulating at the rate of about a millimetre a year, uh, so that some of our peatlands are now an incredible 12 metres deep. <clears throat> in the UK, or in Britain and Ireland, what we have are two main types of peatland. Uh, the first is the bogs, and they're categorized into two types. Uh, the first is of those is the blanket bogs. Uh, and as their name suggests, they, they blanket the countryside. It looked like a mantle hey. of peat uh, spreading across the, the hills. I've got somebody's uh, microphones on. Um, and uh, these are the sort of typical scenes that you'll see in the, in the, the hilly mountainous countryside, the Cairngorms and all our upland areas of Scotland these blanket bogs spreading across the, the landscape. The second type is, um, sorry, I'm just going to, to explain here that the UK and Scotland holds the world's best example and largest example of an Atlantic blanket bog, the famous flow country, nearly 400,000 hectares of blanket bog um, up in the, the north of Caithness and Sutherland, and uh, within that is the remarkable uh, RSPB Forsenard Reserve, which uh, is one of, again, one of the biggest and best of the, the peatland nature reserves in Europe, if not the world. So the second type of bog is the raised bog, lowland raised bog, because as its name suggests, it often occurs in the lowlands. And it tends to occur as a, a, an isolated dome of peat in an agricultural landscape. And because it's primarily water, it literally does form a dome as if you had a bubble of water on a tabletop. Here's uh, Cranley Moss. It, it, you can see there is a slight dome, but this, like many raised bogs, has had its bubble burst by uh, centuries of cutting and burning and uh, loss of uh, peat and so the dome has collapsed but it still contains much of its peatland vegetation and if you pushed a rod 
down the peat in the middle of that, you would you would need a rod 12 meters deep. Uh, people have done it, and it's, it's incredible how deep that peat is. <clears throat> so both bogs, blanket bog and raised bog, the, the characteristic element of these is the sphagnum mosses, wonderful plants which uh, thrive in these acidic waterlogged uh, conditions. The, the sphagnum plant is, is an incredible thing. It, uh, its cell structure allows it to hold 20 times its weight in water. It, it allows it to, like a sponge, we don't use the sponge analogy too much, but it effectively can absorb many times its weight in, in water. Because of that, when, when you go into a peat bog, remarkably, peatland and a, peat, a thriving healthy peat bog is 90, over 90% 90 water. It has less solids in it than milk, yet you're able to move across the surface of the bog because of the remarkable structure of the, the leaves of the sphagnum plant. It creates a, a rigid structure that allows you to walk across and uh, be supported. The plant also contains uh, phenolic compounds, and these in addition to the anaerobic wet conditions, these phenolic compounds limit decay and help further preserve not just the plant, but anything else that goes in the bog and uh, prevents it from decaying. And, Hello. Oh, we're another another person's microphone still on. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll just come in there, Clifton, and, and ask all participants. There's two participants who have not muted their microphone. And every time they cough, etc., it's interrupting the presentation. Could I ask you, please, all to check that your microphones are muted? Um, so could everyone please do that and ensure that you're muted? Uh, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the, 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 the amazing features of sphagnum, uh, the, the plant was actually harvested uh, during the First and Second World Wars. Uh, and there's famous stories of it being used as an absorptive material uh, and because of its sterile qualities as well, it provided ideal um, wound dressing for the, the soldiers out there in the First World War. And all sorts of communities from the Highlands of Scotland down through the north of England used to be paid to go out and collect sphagnum to be given to soldiers who would keep little pouches of sphagnum moss as a wound dressing out in the trenches. One of the other features of this very sterile, um, low nutrient environment, because these are waterlogged places and the bog and the peat is above the mineral layer in the surrounding soil, it doesn't have any nutrient content in it. So the plants that grow there can only get their nutrients from the little amount of nutrients within the rainwater. And many of the plants have therefore adapted to supplement their, their nutrients by eating insects. And so you have the famous sundews uh, here, which have sticky droplets uh, on their leaves. And when a fly is trapped, the, leaf, the tentacles curl into the center and enzymes break down the, the, the trapped insect and is digested in effect by the plant. And there are two or three different uh, mechanisms. You've got bladder worts, which catch things uh, in, a, in a sort of bubble and you've got butterworts which have a very fine hair of sticky droplets on their leaves and the leaf curls in as well. So these are uh, beautifully adapted and, and found only on our, on our bogs. The open expanse of our blanket bogs also provides fantastic habitat for breeding waders. Uh, so golden plovers, Dunlin here, and if you look at the distribution of Dunlin in the UK, very closely associated with bogs, blanket bogs, and very much where the sphagnum cover is at its highest. So this is a bird species that depends on the peatland habitats for nesting and food for its young. Our other peatland group, apart from the bogs, are the fens. And uh, these are areas of peatland that form where there's a collection of water. So in a depression in the ground, a hollow, uh, a, a valley, anywhere, a seepage zone in the hillsides, 
anywhere that water collects. Um, but the mineral content of the surrounding soil is available to the plant. So rather than mosses being the dominant plant, it's sedges and reeds that dominate because they can get that higher mineral content and, and survive there. And um, these fens were once extensive across Britain, but now massively reduced because they occur in the lowlands where agricultural production, basically they were drained and, uh, and removed. And what you have left of our fens are tiny little isolated pockets. Uh, the East Anglia, the Fenlands, used to cover the whole of Cambridgeshire and uh, East Anglia, and now a few little nature reserve Fenland areas in an arable landscape. Here in Scotland, our most famous and indeed internationally famous fen is at Inch Marshes, Ruthven Barracks, the RSPB nature reserve there. Um, it's uh, one of the largest semi-natural river floodplains uh, in Europe, and it plays a key role in uh, maintaining fresh water, sorry, in uh, protecting downstream villages from flooding it. It helps capture and store water and uh, acts as a buffer for uh, preventing flooding downstream. And one of the, the features of a, of a fen is that this high nutrient status means that it has a very rich insect life uh, and supports some of the highest concentrations of invertebrate species of any of our habitats. And as a result of all that insect food, there is a very rich bird population. So you get a lot of warblers uh, and uh, it's a very noisy atmosphere in, in, in the, uh, the fens. You hear a lot of loud singing warbler species, um, mainly because the, the vegetation is so lush that they need to be loud, even though they're small birds often, they need to be loud to be uh, to, for their mates or potential mates to hear them or, or for their neighbors to be uh, warned off. So they tend to be loud singers in that very lush, uh, dense vegetation. One of the uh, clues to the fact that fens were much more widespread is uh, in the European crane. And this is a bird species which was once common across Britain um, and uh, had become absent for nearly 400 years. And if you look around old maps, old place names, the old English word for uh, crane was cran. And so Famous places like Cranmere, um, the, the other word, uh, the Norse word Tran was the, the, the name for a crane. And again, places like Tranmere um, were obviously places where cranes occurred. And uh, even in Scotland, just along from Inch Marshes, there's a little area called um, the Battle of Crane Loch, which was fought in the 11th century. And so obviously there was a crane loch near Inch Marshes. Um, on the Muir of Dinnet, you've got um, Boggan Cora, which is the Gaelic for Bog of the Crane. So again, all clues that fens were more widespread uh, around the UK and rich in birds like the crane. One of the other features of these peatlands, both bogs and fens, is their ability to store. So the, the, the lack of uh, aerobic uh, breakdown by bacteria and in the bogs, the sphagnum uh, phenolic compounds preserves whatever is in the bog. And here's a photograph uh, of a peatland at the side of uh, Strathveig where pine trees that were growing 4,000 years ago have been preserved in the peat and then exposed when the hydroelectric uh, facility was constructed, the water levels went up and down and scoured the peat away, exposing these 4,000 year old trees that have been, uh, the, the, they've had uh, the, the dating, radiocarbon dating, and uh, these trees were alive and growing uh, around the uh, Bronze Age. So this is one of the wonderful features. If you touch that wood, it just feels like it was brand new yesterday, but there it is, a 4,000 year preserved uh, tree trunk. So 
the bogs are preserving ecological information that tells us much about what was growing in and around the peatlands. Here the story is that the forests that occurred straight after the end of the last ice age, as the climate changed, it became cooler and wetter around 4,000 years ago, the forest died back and the bog took over and that's what's remaining. You also have um, the pollen of neighbouring trees and plants preserved in the peatland. So you can monitor by looking through the layers of peat how the surrounding landscape has changed. And it beautifully, um, these charts show how Neolithic farmers came in, cleared the forests, changed the vegetation. Uh, there was much more frequent burning going on. And then as grazing livestock came in, all the plant communities changed and their pollen gives a wonderful story of how that's uh, changed throughout the, the millennia. You also have incredible cultural artifacts in the, the peatlands and probably the most popular and amazing are the bog bodies. Um, if you've heard, there are literally hundreds of bog bodies that have been found across Europe preserved in the peat bogs, most of them found when commercial peat extractors have gone through the bog and disturbed them. And a lot has been learned about these amazing bodies. These are mostly from the Iron Age or slightly into the early Romano period, but mostly from the Iron Age, mostly ritual killings, sacrifices of some way, and often including very high status individuals. This is uh, this unfortunate red-haired man with uh, a surprising uh, similarity to a president in America's uh, haircut. Um, he actually wasn't red-haired, it's the, the, the bog uh, has turned his hair red, but he was killed and then maimed and tortured and all sorts of ritualized injuries given to him before he was pinned down into the bog. And they suspect he was a high status individual, probably a an Irish uh, chieftain king and probably sacrificed during a period of bad harvests or something like that. And this is repeated regularly in the, the, the bog bodies that are found across uh, the UK. Uh, and there is a suspicion that bogs were revered. They were a, a sort of in-between place from the earth and water and on the journey into passing into the water, which was the sacred place. And many structures have been built that allowed these Iron Age people into the bog, but didn't take them out. It was, a, it was definitely the journey. Often they find um, walkways preserved, wooden pathways, trackways preserved in the peat. This is one that's uh, again about two and a half thousand years old in uh, County uh, Mayo. The, uh, the uh, oh, I've just gone and forgotten the uh, tra Corley Trackway. Sorry, there we go. The Corley Trackway. Um, these are about three meter wide oak planks, and the trees were probably each about three hundred year old trees. Substantial amount of work involved in cutting them down to make this trackway that was preserved in the bog in in Northern Ireland and. Uh, the trackway doesn't cross the bog. You would think it was a way to get across the wetland. It actually leads into the bog and stops. And so they think that these were ritual passageways into the peatland. So a very different perspective of peatlands back then. The peat itself has long been used in uh, Britain as a, as a fuel. Uh, in our uplands, we, we lost so much of our forest very early on that uh, our Bronze and Iron Age uh, ancestors turned to burning peat. And the Romans remarked on this, that the Celtic tribes burned earth for fuel. It was uh, considered an oddity by them. And our big medieval monastery uh, cities, York, and, um, Norfolk, Norwich, all had massive amount of industrial peat extraction from the surrounding areas to provide fuel for the big uh, cathedrals. And uh, there's documented evidence of just how many thousands of tons of peat 
were extracted from the nearby hillsides. Well, I say nearby, from a right across Yorkshire and uh, Norwich, the peat was being removed. And then obviously in the highland remote communities, peat cutting for fuel still goes on, and as, as it does in, in Ireland. The Irish took peat burning to a, an industrial scale right up until just a few years ago, they were burning peat commercially in electricity generating power stations. Probably the biggest and most recent of the, the huge environmental changes that affected our peatlands was the agricultural changes. Uh, starting quite early on in the, in the 14th and 5th, sorry, in the 17th century, much of the lowland East Anglia fenlands around Cambridgeshire were converted or attempted conversion by draining the peatlands so they could turn it into agricultural grazing land and arable land. And the, the, the famous Dutch engineer Vermuyden was employed to, uh, to help with the engineering because huge drains had to be built to extract water out of the peat. But at the time, uh, some of the locals started to complain because they were noticing that when you remove water from a peatland, it subsides and it began to flood and they were losing hunting land and valuable land that they used for um, gathering reeds, for, for gathering game. And the agriculturalists were being ruthless in their drainage. And there were actually petitions to parliament. And this was around the time of Oliver Cromwell and he heard these petitions and sided with the rich farmers and the locals used to get up in arms and it was quite serious uh, rural disruption going on as the locals tried to prevent this modern agriculture. The bottom right hand picture there um, is of the, the drainage work taking place in the, the, the sort of early 16th century, 17th century. And this was an era when Oliver Cromwell had defeated the Scottish famous battles at Dunbar and thousands of Scottish prisoners were taken down to the fens and forced to work to drain the peatlands in East Anglia. And the story of these Scottish prisoners, as well as unfortunate uh, Flemish prisoners, uh, in horrendous conditions probably, uh, working to drain the, the peatlands of East Anglia is one that I don't think many people in Scotland have uh, fully appreciated. No. My, uh... oh. So at the time of that agricultural drainage works, um, one uh, well-known local landowner decided that he was so concerned at the subsidence that was going on in the surrounding land that he pushed a, a, a metal rod down into the peat to hit the mineral hard layer underneath. And in 170 years, this is the home fen post, the bog surface was at the top of that post 170 years ago and has dropped four metres in that time. And it is a remarkable, absolutely incredible visual evidence of just how much change had arisen as, as a result of that peat subsidence. So our next phase, as you move into the, the, the more modern agricultural reform, the 18th century, some very famous Scottish agroeconomists were writing treaties saying that our peatlands were worthless, uh, no, no use to modern agriculture, and should generally be uh, treated as unproductive wastes. And James Anderson's second book uh, basically described how to turn them into more productive agricultural land, and that just involved draining the water from them in a huge amount of Scottish uplands and English uplands were converted to what they deemed was better quality agricultural land. In parts of uh, central Scotland, if you've come across Flanders moss, they went a step further and actually physically removed the peat and took it down in barges and dumped it in the sea around the Firth of Forth 
in an attempt to get to the mineral layer beneath the peat. Huge amount of operation and again, hundreds and hundreds of people employed to, uh, to do that in this attempt to turn the peatland into something else. The locals in uh, around the, the ports of uh, the Firth of Forth didn't like it because all that dumped peat damaged their shipping routes, disturbed fisheries and uh, was not welcome. And eventually the whole thing was stopped because it wasn't productive in the end either. The consequence of all of this long history of change is that we're now left with only 20% of our former peatland area in a near natural state. Most of it has either been completely removed or has been damaged and is no longer supporting the typical peatland vegetation. Um, and uh, that map shows you the, the red areas are the very deep peat areas and the, the green areas are the more shallow peat areas that uh, occur. But you can see there that Scotland is the stronghold for the UK's deep peat. And indeed in Europe, we're one of the strongholds, probably because we've got this wet Atlantic climate that is ideal for bog formation. So I was saying at the start of the talk, we have turned the corner and we're now in a new era, certainly in the last 20 years, the evidence has started to come forward and programmes like ourselves, making it clear to decision makers that actually peatlands have a value for climate change, for water quality, flood alleviation, biodiversity, sport, leisure, and that uh, incredible historic archive are all things we should value in our healthy peatlands. The uh, problem for our peatlands uh, meant that all of that in ag agricultural conversion that we saw in the 18th and 19th century produced upland grazing that actually wasn't very economic. And the bogs, as a result of all the drainage work, started to deteriorate and erode. And this erosion was not useful for the sheep farmers. Lambs get trapped in these huge gullies that can be six feet deep. Uh, the soil is literally washing down the hill. And so the farmers are not happy about the loss of their land in, in, in some ways. Um, for the moorland, uh, sporting moorland owners, grouse chicks get trapped in these gullies and uh, the, the, the vegetation is of no use to the, the feeding chicks. It's bare. In parts of the Peak District, you have thousands of hectares of bare, bland peat surface with nothing growing on it, all because of the drainage and destruction and the pollution of the Victorian era. Downstream, if you imagine all these blanket bogs in the tops of the hills eroding and washing away, downstream you're having two impacts. Um, water quality, the, the, the peat in, in sediment form washes down and blocks up the filters in the drinking water treatment plants. Um, the brown water also reacts with the chemicals that are put in to, uh, to deal with bacteria and create carcinogens. So the water companies have to go up the hill and are now paying to repair the peat bogs because it's cheaper than treating the water downstream. Um, and in Scotland, we've had Scottish water recently starting to invest in restoring peatlands because they've estimated some of the costs of the damaged peatlands affecting their drinking water supply process. And it is millions of pounds impact on the water company that ultimately we as taxpayers are, uh, are paying for. The other big issue that woke up government's mind is the carbon story. Our peatlands are the biggest carbon, natural carbon source, uh, far bigger than even the world's forests. Um, in the UK, our peatlands hold 3.2 billion tonnes of carbon. Just losing a quarter of that would be, uh, sorry, just losing 5% of that would be equivalent to all of our annual fossil fuel emissions in the UK. It's a huge amount of carbon locked up in these bogs, but it's only locked up while the bogs are wet because the minute the bogs dry out, the bare peat 
is available for bacteria to rot it. It oxidizes, releases carbon dioxide, and uh, that is the way in which it emits its stored carbon that's been there for thousands of years. Bacterial decay and, and drying out causes it to oxidize and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the quantities of carbon dioxide are immense. 23 million tons of CO2 coming out of our damaged peat bogs every year. If you look at all of our forests, they're only sequestering, sucking out of the atmosphere, 18 million tonnes of CO2. So we're negating all that wonderful forestry work we've been doing. Um, so it's significant and it cannot continue because the longer we leave our peat bogs, the faster they degrade and the more carbon dioxide they release. And that's what was uh, making government very concerned. We've now had economists coming into the game and there's been a lot of work done on assessing the value of nature and quantifying what the cost to society is from damage to water, the carbon impacts, et cetera. And the figures are astronomical, you know, billions of pounds, billions of pounds of impact to society from the damage that we've done to our peatlands. So instead of making a profit for a few farmers, we've imposed a billions of pound cost on society. And uh, it's a lesson that, again, nature matters, not just as a nice thing, but is underpinning our costs and uh, our economy. So as a basic principle to leave you with that, a damaged bog is more than a little inconvenient. I hope you've got that message. The good news now is that we can do something about it. This is one of these environmental stories where we can actually see a positive way forward. In the UK, we've had a long history of restoring peatlands and we were at the forefront of this activity in, in the world. And it was Scottish Wildlife Trust with their raised bog project over 20 years ago that um, with European funding um, managed to start repairing some of these degraded damaged peatlands by blocking the loss of water. You can see there a plastic dam. Uh, nowadays we use peat itself. We move the peat into the ditches to block the water or uh, wooden dams. And the technique works. We've been monitoring this now for nearly 30 years and it is restoring the water table rises again, the carbon loss is reduced, the brown water is reduced, the flooding is reduced, and the birds and some of the key species come back within five to 10 years. Obviously you don't get the whole lost ecosystem back immediately, but it really quickly stops further degradation. Uh, paying for all of this restoration is, because it's about a thousand pounds a hectare to, to restore a peatland. These are all privately owned sites. We can't blame the landowners for having damaged them in the past because it was society that paid them to do it. Uh, government gave them grants to drain the bogs. So we as society really ought to pay for it to be repaired. And the UK is again at the forefront in, in the world in setting millions of pounds aside to pay for peatland restoration. And landowners can get grants to repair the peat bog. In Scotland, we have the, the Peatland Action Programme, which administers the grants. And you can see there, just even since 2013, these figures are probably a couple of years old now, and um, hundreds of sites starting to be repaired. Um, and you know, it, it costs 10 million over five years or so, but when you consider the billions of pounds saving, it's a wise investment, as uh, Nicola Sturgeon said. Here's uh, projects even in some of our most extremely damaged peatlands. If any of you have been on parts of the Cairngorms where centuries of heavy grazing pressure, drainage, burning, deer have all led to the, the, the peatland vegetation giving up basically. And you have these horrendous areas of gullies and erosion, which are a nightmare to try and walk across. Even they are uh, experiencing restoration efforts to, to, to help bring the vegetation back and uh, stop that loss. And in terms of scale, here's up in the flow country where during the 1980s, we had the massive uh, forest plantations put onto the peatlands. And again, not particularly successful. 
the trees didn't grow well, but in the process they damaged the bogs. Well, these trees are now being removed and the bogs being repaired. And just to give you a sense of scale, that's the train that takes you up from Inverness to Forsenard. So this is the Tallahill block that was uh, undertaken nearly 10 years ago by RSPB, again with European funding. Government is putting millions of pounds into this, but we've got such a big job and such an urgency that we're going to have to bring in private investment. And there are a number of initiatives now to bring money from business into paying for nature. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, carbon finance, where companies pay for carbon projects in order to offset their emissions from their businesses. And what we've got is a standard, the Peatland Code, that means if anybody does one of these projects, it has to be done in a genuine way that delivers real quantifiable carbon benefits. And in return, projects can get money from the private sector to pay for restoration alongside government grants. Other ways of doing this are to make peatlands of value in their healthy state, rather than having to have peatlands only being valuable when you drain them and grow arable crops or sheep. You now have, um, with lessons learned from Germany and Holland, what's called polluticulture. And it's basically just means wet farming. You farm the wet peatland and you, you gather different types of crops. You, you gather the rushes, the reeds, and use them in biofuels, or you make wooden panelling or reedy panelling. It's like fibreboard made from the rushes and the reeds. Or you gather the sphagnum mosses, and there are now a range of uh, products from industrial biofilters to horticultural peat alternatives using the sphagnum that's harvested from these sites. These are once formerly arable croplands that are now growing as wet blanket bo uh, wet raised bogs. Having explained that we've come through this era of enlightenment, enlightenment and government paying for restoration, uh, there is good protection for peatlands now generally with nature conservation law, but not perfect protection. Uh, there are a couple of threats still knocking at the door. One of the biggest and, and sadly, uh, an ironic uh, impact is the wind farms built to help tackle climate change, reduce our carbon emissions from fossil fuel burning. But the economies mean that it's cheaper to put them onto bogs because again, bogs were still valued as less than arable or agricultural land. So the wind farm companies targeted the peat bogs. The problem is, when you build a wind farm on a peat bog, it loses more carbon because you're damaging the bog, you're having to drain it, you're sticking things into it, uh, you're killing the wildlife that lives and flies above the bog. And so we've argued very hard that wind farms are needed, but not on peat bogs, because you compromise the carbon benefit of the wind farm by releasing the carbon from the bogs. And in some of the worst situations, the loss from the peatland negates the whole 25 year life of the wind farm. But even if it only negates part of it, that's not the right solution. We need both healthy peat bogs and our wind farms operating at 100% in order to tackle climate change. Compromising both makes no sense. The other problem we've got is the forestry is the same. It's, there is still pressure for forests on peatland because the forestry sector wants to meet its climate targets can't get onto the agricultural land because it's too expensive, so aims for the peatlands. Uh, generally, we don't allow forestry on the deepest peats, but much of Scotland has shallower peatlands and uh, has a legacy of old plantations on peatlands that are being restocked at harvest. And the paleoecological information, the, the information stored in the peat, shows us quite clearly that the UK's peatlands, our blanket bogs, are naturally treeless and have been for 10,000 years. Trees do not grow naturally in deep peat. Where they do grow is in the surrounding gravel slopes and hills where the water drains and the peat doesn't form. 
And so a, a mosaic of trees and bog is probably the way our landscape has looked in much of the highlands. So where we should be putting the trees is back into the areas that they were lost on the steeper slopes, the more heavily drained ground. And so there's an opportunity to expand our forestry and protect our peatlands. And like with the wind farms, we shouldn't be fighting one against the other. The other big current threat is we still have over a hundred sites in Scotland with planning permission for peat extraction, mainly for horticultural peat extraction. A little bit of it goes into the whiskey industry. Um, and it's so sad because 70% of the peat extracted in the UK goes to the amateur market, mostly dumped by us into our gardens as so-called soil conditioner, when actually that is the use that there is the best alternatives available. Um, the peat industry argued for a long time, oh, there's so much peat, we only use a tiny proportion. The fact is, the peat extraction industry operates mainly in the lowland raised bogs, which are a very rare habitat. This isn't your widespread blanket bog. It's these little pockets because it's deep and accessible and the industry takes its horticultural peat from those sites. You can hardly see them on this map, they're so small. There's only 3,800 hectares of lowland bog left in the UK, and those are some of the best sites in Europe. Uh, and that is less than 5% of its original area. We've lost so much, and yet these are the sites. Instead of repairing them and restoring them, they're still being extracted for commercial horticulture. So after 30 years, I've spent my life fighting for a ban on peat in horticulture. The government has finally consulted, so the, the UK government consulted in England and Wales uh, on, a, on a ban of the sale of peat, a retail ban, and the public response was overwhelming. Over 95% of the public positively agreed they wanted a ban on peat extraction. Quite incredible. Um, Scottish government, Northern Ireland and Wales have all come in alongside and said they too want a ban on peat. Um, unfortunately, they're going slower uh, and the danger is we're going to have Scotland as the rogue nation where rogues will buy their, their peat from. So we need a UK approach and the four countries are busy talking to each other about how they can do this. But as you can imagine, relationships and the devolved structure we currently have is not making it easy. But there is a commitment to a ban on peat in the other three countries. And we could hear of a ban being introduced in England and Wales literally in the next week or so, which will be incredible, fantastic. One of the ministers once said to me in Scotland, we can't ban peat because so many businesses depend on it. But actually what we've shown through the IUCN work in our demonstrating success booklet is that actually what we do in the UK by having a healthy peat-free industry is we get one step ahead of the rest of Europe. We produce sustainable materials, our plant growing sector becomes sustainable and we're creating a business that's fit for the future because Europe's going to face a peat ban shortly as well. So we have the opportunity to bring our industry and our business up and get the investment now into making good quality peat-free products and learn about how to make the right products for the right uses and have thriving businesses that will be competitive in a European market. It'd be so sad if all we end up doing in five years time is importing peat-free material from Germany or Holland. Why don't we have us being the masters? And currently the UK has some phenomenal products and these are now widely available in the in the, the retail outlets so it's a success story economically not just an environmental story final big threat really is uh, burning um, a lot of as you'll be aware a lot of our upland areas are managed as grouse moors and the sporting sector has managed those heather moors by burning to provide better quality young heather for the grouse to feed on They've now, under threat of a ban on burning, the, the, the science has, has become polarised. We have one side saying burning's good. It releases lots of ash. When you burn the heather, all the ash falls onto the peat bog 
and increases the carbon content of the bog. Well, I could go onto a bog and dump a bucket of coal onto the bog. That would increase the carbon, but it's, it means nothing. The, the bog is suffering when it's burned. The vegetation gets damaged, the peat itself can burn. And when you damage the vegetation that keeps a bog wet and thriving, you risk it deteriorating and you lose the wildlife and you lose the carbon. The trouble is we have, as I say, very polarized science at the moment. And uh, the position we've come to is clearly that as things stand, there is clear evidence that burning damages peatlands, uh, not just the peat soil, but the, the wildlife that depends on the peatlands. And the best way to deal with the threat of wildfires, people say wildfires, most of them are started by somebody going out there with a match, either as Moorburn going out of control or people with barbecues or whatever, or deliberate um, arson. Anyway, the risk of fire is reduced if you make the bog wet. The reason we have our peatlands in this dry state vulnerable to fire is because we've drained them for 2000 years and they're dominated by heather and dry peat instead of being dominated by sphagnum and water. That isn't going to be a serious wildfire threat if a fire does go, it would just flip across the surface. That, on the other hand, is what happens when you have thousands of years of mismanagement of a bog. It builds up shrubby, woody layer of heather that is vulnerable to burning. And so the pattern of moorburn, regular moorburn, is maintaining that heather, which is a symptom of an unhealthy bog. So we want our bogs back to sphagnum moss. We mustn't let the narrative of these conflicts dictate our peatland story. My visits to Ireland really opened up my eyes as to how Ireland as a people have an amazing connection with their peatlands. Um, poets, artists, authors all talk about peatlands. It's part of their fabric, their culture. We've lost that in some ways, in, even in Scotland. Uh, the connection with our bogs isn't there. But there's been some good socioeconomic uh, research speaking to people in the Northern Isles, the West Highlands, and they do value their peatlands as a place to live in. They feel it's where they live, it's their environment around them, it, what makes them Highlanders, etc. They feel connected to their peatlands and they understand that they live in a peatland environment. So this idea that peatlands can help you in appreciating the environment you live in, um, if we go back pre-industrial era, people valued peatlands as places for gathering game and, and materials. And even further back, spiritually, peatlands were a place that the Irish saints used to go to get replenished spiritually. And so for me in the modern times, a visit to a peatland is an amazing experience because you, you see the wildlife, the incredible wildlife, going on to the flow country and seeing hundreds of Golden Plover, Dunlin, Greenshanks, and hearing the sounds, it's, uh, that's uplifting. And so we must remember that that's the true value of peatlands. When people talk about dark, smelly, horrible peatlands, they're usually talking about a damaged peatland. And it's only when you get into a healthy one that you can see the colors and the amazing uh, experience. So get out and see a peatland and appreciate that they're actually incredibly nice places. They have phenomenal features. This is the Forsenard RSPB reserve up in the flow country. It has to be on everybody's visit list. It really is quite an, it's just unique habitat that you do not get this experience anywhere else in Europe. I've had European colleagues say to me, nowhere in Europe do we have one end of the landscape to another without anything in it, uh, apart from the RSPB's lovely <laughs> observation tower. But this is right next to Forsenard railway station. You can't see the, the houses or the railway station are just behind it. But you can come off the train, walk out into that observation tower and just see this amazing landscape. And uh, to experience it is, is something quite special. 
If you go into the north of England and right throughout uh, the UK, many of our long distance tracks, the Pennine Way, um, follow through peatlands and they've all got lovely roots. You know, this is uh, old mill stone, stones from the, the, the floors of the old mills in Northern England were refurbished and laid down across the bog uh, in, in the Peak District. And uh, here in uh, the border in the Quilka Mountains, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland near Enniskillen, You've got the Stairway to Heaven, it's called. Um, it's a, a huge boardwalk that leads you up to Quilka Mountain. Um, and again, just a, an incredible experience. Many of the old uh, preserved ancient Iron Age trackways, they think were built as a symbol to neighboring clans that look how good we are, we can build this. That is a, <laughs> it's a spectacular symbol of uh, achievement. It did have problems, too many people, there was about 100,000 people a year now go on that boardwalk and they all went to the top of the mountain and then spilled out and damaged the vegetation on the top of the mountain. So they're now trying to, to manage things and encourage people to use public transport instead of driving into the villages to take this. But it's become an international phenomenon, this uh, stairway to heaven. As we restored our bogs, many of the local authorities and um, nature conservation bodies also put in uh, visitor facilities. So you'll often find these peat bogs have great access. They've got boardwalks, they've got information. Uh, Flanders Moss in Stirling, I was talking about earlier, has been repaired and is an amazing day out. And I'll see people with push chairs walking around during the day, just enjoying being out in the, in the bog. This is a lovely little seating area in the middle of Flanders Moss and the observation tower there. Again, giving you a chance to experience the peatland without getting yourself too wet and uh, sunk in. Blohorn Moss near Armadale, just north of the Forth Road Bridge. They, uh, they put in some, uh, they used a local sculptor, the, 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 the blazing saddler, I think, uh, the, 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 the blazing blacksmith. He, uh, he built these sculptures that reflected some of the wildlife that you get on the, the peatland. And again, a, a lovely day out right next to busy conurbations. The final thing to say is that one of the things that peatland suffered from was a, a miss perception, a misunderstanding. We need people out there. We need people to appreciate that peatlands are valuable to our culture, our heritage, biodiversity, and our well-being. We've come out through a pandemic where people were locked up, and I, like many others, a day out on a peat bog, you just, you breathe. You've got space, you just feel you can relax. It's a, it's a quite a, a powerful, opportunity and many of the raised bogs in the Clyde Forth Valley have community groups helping repair them and these community groups give fantastic stories of how this is their weekend outdoor gym or some of the children that grew up in their teenage years helping their parents restoring the bog and working on the bog are now working in conservation and environmental work because they got so enthused by these trips to the bog. Meanwhile, I've got councillors saying to me, oh, people in these built up communities, they've got so many troubles, they don't care about nature. Nonsense. They love their bogs. They love getting out and, and working on them and learning about them and, and helping others learn about them. So the power of people being engaging with peatlands and experiencing them is what will help us save them for the future. So I do hope you'll uh, Take the opportunity to read my book and get yourself out around some of Britain's peatlands. Um, there is a 5% discount. Um, the code is peatlands5 off. If you go into the Sandstone Press uh, shop, uh, you'll get that 5% discount. Normally I would have copies of the book to give you and sign. Um, and that's available, I think, until about the 11th of February, that code will work. And then after that, no longer so. I do hope you'll uh, take the chance to go and get yourself a copy and enjoy it. And I'll leave it as that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Clifton. And we'll hand over to Dan now to lead the questions and discussion.
Uh, for those of you who might not have been able to join us right at the beginning, uh, Dan Poplett is the Vice Chair of the North of Scotland Local Group. So over to you, meantime, Dan. Great. Thanks, John. And <clears throat> thanks, Clifton. Found that really fascinating talk. And uh, I was already enthusiastic about peatlands, but now I'm even more enthusiastic. So <laughs> great stuff. And um, just looking at questions here, um, well, we've got a question from Michelle asking, so what can the average person do to help? So there's a couple of things. Um, first is certainly use peat free in your gardening. I've gardened peat free for nearly 15, 20 years. Um, so there's simple things you can do in, in, in the products you buy, don't, don't buy peat. Um, you can get actively involved. Um, we have National Bog Day every July, where all the NGOs that own and manage peatland sites, and in fact, some of the public statutory agencies have open days. So go and visit a bog, um, but don't just do it in July. You know, the sites in my book, there are many peat bogs to go and visit. I think I worked out once that there is nowhere in Britain that's more than a 50 minute bus drive from a peat bog. So uh, you've no excuse. Even in Edinburgh, we've got Red Moss of Balerno just up on the hills behind us. And it's a lovely place to go for a walk. Um, so go out and visit a peatland. If you want to take it a step further, um, there are, if you, if you depends where you live, there are uh, community involvement groups. Uh, I'm not so sure up in the Cairngorms and places, but it could be worth asking in the National Park if there are any community groups. Certainly uh, in the Forth Clyde area, there are community groups you can join and volunteer to help repair the peatlands. Um, you can approach the likes of butterfly conservation, plant life, and they have volunteers helping with monitoring wildlife on the peatlands. Uh, that's always uh, a good experience and very useful thing to do. Um, if you're concerned about things like peat and horticulture, you can go a step further and let your MP or MSP know Writing to MSPs is something that matters. They get very few letters of, of consequence and telling them you really appreciate peatlands and you really hope they'll take this legislation to ban the sailing it through is, is an amazingly powerful tool that you have as an individual. And so writing to your MSPs, um, telling other people about the threats and how important peatlands are, I think is one of the biggest jobs that, the, the rise in social groups and uh, small NGOs that are campaigning to protect peatlands is quite incredible. And I've been involved with a lot of small youth groups, et cetera, that are um, just using modern social media to enthuse about peatlands and uh, to create a, a background that makes politicians feel, okay, people are concerned about this. Because 20 years ago, Politicians would just say, nobody cares. If I do something good for peatlands as a politician, nobody's going to pat me on the back. That's changing. And if you want to make that, you know, part of the discussion and get involved in social media groups that are talking about peatlands, then uh, it helps create that background. Um, that's probably as much as I can think of in the, on the top of my head. Great. Thanks, Christian. Um, any other questions? If anyone wants to type in, or if you if you want to um, ask a question directly as well, welcome to. Something that was um, really struck me, Clifton, actually was um, with the fens. So I, was, I often associate fens with East Anglia, and I was aware there would be in other places and, and bits of Scotland, but I didn't realise to what extent. So that was really interesting to me. And I was wondering as well, because obviously there's potential for restoration of fens you know on a wider scale is there anywhere in particular in scotland you think would be a kind of particularly good spot or somewhere you would like to see if you know if you can wave a magic wand and particular area of, of fen i don't so east anglia is incredible and and somerset levels these two parts of of england uh were just huge fenlands because they were low-lying flatland. They, they're, that's what makes them spectacular. We've got the inch marshes. Most, I think historically, most of Scotland's fens probably were smaller. Um, and you still see them in amongst the blanket bogs. You will see little outlets of seepage zones where there's a tiny remnant of 
offend. So I suspect that in Scotland, it's not going to be big showcase projects. It's going to be lots of little projects. But I do think, you know, birds like snipe and, and other things will really benefit, even curlews will benefit from uh, a, a greater widespread repair of fens rather than maybe one big project. I think it's going to be trying to just raise the awareness amongst the farming community that everybody could probably do with looking at where a small fen could be uh, encouraged. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a good point. I think for Scotland, I, I can't think of a, a large fen project. Even up in the flow country, though, there are nice pockets of fen that need some repair. And anywhere is recoverable. So the areas of East Anglia, they are literally tiny little nature reserves surrounded by intensive arable farmland. The Wildlife Trust are working with the National Trust and others and ours are converting that arable land back to fen. It's a long process. You've got to strip out the chemicals. You have a, a period of grassland and then you bring in managing the water is complex in, in an area that's pumped dry by big engines. So it's, it's difficult in those zones, but even there, they're achieving it. And on a grand scale, they're, they're aiming for thousands of hectares of that arable land to be turned back to Fen, so anywhere is possible in Scotland. <laughs> we can get that. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's encouraging to hear. Yeah. So, um, anything else before I hand back to John? And um, oh, we, we have a hand raised from David. Um, do you want to? Yes. Go ahead Thank and... you. That, I was hugely impressed by the brilliant presentation. I'm very grateful to you for it, and I look forward to getting your book. Um, by extraordinary coincidence, in the, in the West Country Free Press right now, the current edition, a, on page 12, it says, Report Hales Land Benefit of Your Burning. <laughs> yes. And it goes on about the fact that the researchers at the University of York are conducting a 20 year long study into the management of heather dominated peatland at the request of Natural England and D. All right. Are you aware of this? Oh yes. So this is Andreas Heinemeyer is the is the lead researcher for this, and he is at one end of the polarized debate, and there are several good scientists at the other end who exposed his methodologies as incomplete. He has looked at the ash of the burning, building up carbon in the bog, but he hasn't looked at the fact that that has damaged the bog and more carbon will come out of the bog system. So his work's been challenged by other scientists as being the wrong methodology. And any good ecologist will just say, why is he fixated on these heather dominated peatlands rather than allow them to become wet natural sphagnum peatlands, which wouldn't have the burning requirement. So yes, his work has been exposed on our website at the IUCN. We list the scientific papers that challenge his work. Uh, and Young is one of the researchers who's most uh, recently exposed the, the failings of that scientific work. As always, we find this in the scientific community. When you have a polarized debate, it's because somebody isn't studying the peatland properly. And uh, we, need to, we need to improve the methodologies. Um, thank you for that, but just if I could add to it, Given the fact that hereabouts there is a tradition of confrontation between nature because wildlife folk on the one hand and local crofters on the other, it would be great if you could possibly get a letter into the editor of the West Ham Press. If you get a moment spare to do that, it would be um, very good. I'm literally speaking to RSPB tomorrow about this very topic because, um, well, I, what I do say to most people, I will, I will be looking at that. What I do say to most people is go to our website where we've got a briefing on burning and this latest science that is being reported doesn't change the position in our briefing because uh, we we explain why his science is wrong. So um, if anybody is is querying the burning science, use our briefing as a, as a way forward. And yes, I'm literally speaking to RSPB tomorrow about 
how we tackle in the media the the false stories that are spreading around that would be great thank you very much thanks for your question david thank you clifton and if there's unless there's anything else one thing i would just add i'd really um i would second you on that clifton about a force i was fortunate to go there maybe about four years ago for the first time and it was just superb really uh i was really struck by the just kind of the the vastness and the kind of splendor of the of the peat bog it was really incredible so yeah anyone get the chance there or now i'm really excited to visit i've been to some others but i can see there's a lot more that i haven't visited so i'm uh I'm well you can get yourself down to dartmoor people often say to me oh, is this not just a highland scotland thing I was going, nope <laughs> it's blanket bogs in dartmoor yeah yeah superb and there's quite a few uh comments coming in um uh, of appreciation for the talk as well so, it's great thank you clifton and with that i'll uh, hand back to our chair john Thank you very much, Dan. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, well, um, uh, you've stimulated a, a, a lot of interest and you've covered a lot of ground um, tonight, Clifton. Uh, I hadn't appreciated, uh, first of all, I think uh, probably some members also uh, may not have appreciated the phenomenal scale of IUCN. I, that, that's a tremendous achievement to have accumulated somewhere between two and three thousand partners i mean we we all think in our own organizations of course that we should collaborate more with other nature conservation organizations and we do attempt to do that locally in places but the scale of this internationally is phenomenal um i also hadn't appreciated of course the scale of your low carbon decision for travel around all the sites wow <laughs> what an achievement uh and what an example to set while you while you're studying uh, peatlands. That's that's fantastic. Well, um, I think we'd all like to thank you, and it's expressed in some of the comments that have been flashed up there, for a very clear explanation and illustration, both of the nature of the different types uh, of habitat that make up peatlands uh, and of their living inhabitants. Uh, and then you went on, of course, to describe the implications for us or, of preserving peatlands and the implication for us if we don't preserve our peatlands. Um, so uh, you covered a, a lot of ground on that. And I think the other very interesting thing for me was that uh, by illustrating for us uh, the information that can come from peatlands, it's apparent that the study of peatlands um, informs so many different disciplines. It's not just about the animal and plant life, but it's about social, cultural, historical perspectives uh, that come from the phenomenal preservation uh, of the contents of, of peatlands, including the bog bodies and, and the structures that lie, lie therein. Um, you talked us through the traditional view of peatlands, and of course, some sadly still have that traditional view, perhaps, of them being unproductive and uh, uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time converting them into arable lands. So it's nice to hear of the new era for peatlands now and uh, of some period of enlightenment and that that's actually translating through into some government policy. And uh, let's, let's be optimistic and hope that the four nations come together and uh, get some real action uh, on that uh, in what's currently being discussed and get that transformed into legislation. We talked also about the economic value uh, of the uh, of the peatlands um, and the habitats, and it's good to see that that's now recognised and being quantified by economists. Um, I loved your little illustration uh, of the damaged bog more than being more than a little bit inconvenient. <laughs> uh, a very uh, simple illustration, but you've gone through many of the complexities for us. Uh, of the, the really widespread and significant implications of damaged peatlands and what we can do individually and collectively uh, to try and turn that position round, which is, which is great. So like you, I would recommend to everyone uh, who's been stimulated by what you've said to get a hold of your book. Uh, and for that matter, for those who are interested, your other two books, uh, of which I have copies 
um, that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk uh, on the rainforests of Britain and Ireland and the ancient pine woods of Scotland. Uh, very good reads indeed. So um, this is the point at which I, I can say to everyone, you're very welcome to unmute because I would like us all to give Clifton a very healthy round of applause, which he can hear. So if you'd please unmute your microphones briefly, let's give Clifton uh, a very heartfelt round of applause for covering so much ground tonight. Thank you very much indeed, Clifton. Thank you very much to the few people who managed to unmute. That wasn't, didn't sound too loud, but that's good. Um, and if I could now just briefly uh, see about the future meetings that are coming up. Uh, on Wednesday, the 1st of March at 7.30, we have a presentation on climate change and US from Professor Stuart Angus of the University of Highlands and Islands. Um, he's been very much involved in studying climate change over many years uh, and has a lot uh, to say on that subject. We've had him speak to us before. He's an excellent speaker and it will be a fascinating update uh, on the work of himself and others in that field. So I would encourage those of you who can to join us for that particular presentation. And then on Wednesday, the 5th of April, we have our AGM. And that will be preceded by a presentation which is to be confirmed. And you'll be notified of that through the usual channels. And then that ends our events uh, uh, by Zoom uh, for a wee while until we get into the autumn session. But during the months of May, June, July and August, we traditionally have our summer outings and we will be sending you out details of where we're going this year and hoping that as many of you as possible can come and join us. And we will try to have some geographical spread in that because we appreciate that the size of our uh, boundaries are enormous. So we'll be trying to get across to the west coast if we can for at least one of our outings and try and get some diverse sites for the others. Appreciate it's not easy for uh, all of our members to come to the Inverness area from such big distances, uh, including, of course, the islands. So thank you all very much for your particip participation tonight. I'm sorry about the wee hiccup we had at the beginning. I hope most of you who wanted to join the meeting were able to do so eventually. And apologies for the wait. Uh, so just a final vote of thanks to Clifton for his presentation. Uh, to Dan for chairing the questions and discussion, and most of all to you for joining.